Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is April 15th, 2015, and we are continuing a conversation about rural education. Um, and uh, it's great to have a, a few new people with us, and some of the some of the people who were with us two weeks ago as well. Um, very excited to check in with everybody. Uh, why don't we start uh, with Terrence and then just introduce yourself briefly and uh, right. say what's on your mind quickly. And then well, we'll my name is everyone. Terrence Sanders. I am a middle school teacher at Bramer C4 School in Bramer, Missouri. And I'm excited to talk about diversity and other issues tonight. Cool. Yeah, Karen who's going to introduce herself right now, br brought that up in the last three minutes of the show last time. So, thank you, Karen. <laughs> so, I'm Karen Fassenpower. We have two Karens tonight. Um, I live in Arizona, and I work in mostly in informal and online education, live in a very rural place, and I'm excited to hear what people have to say tonight, especially about diversity in rural communities. Great. Josh, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Joshua Anderson, and uh, I am a third-year doctoral student at Western Michigan University, and uh, I'm actually specializing in rural education, and mm -hmm. specifically uh, social justice and diversity issues. So, very excited to be here. Nice. Karen. Hi. Yeah, Karen. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Karen Bokey. I'm um, an English education professor at Western Michigan University, and my specialty within the area of rural education is uh, migrant farm worker social justice and education. And um, Josh is. Um, my doc student, and we have a lot that we're working on here. Great. And we have we have three two-headed people here mm -hmm. tonight, <laughs> which is great. Which oh. is great. <laughs> Robin, go ahead. Robin and Linda. Okay, I'm Linda Gaines, and I am the English teacher at Dragon Ridge, Missouri. Um, I teach 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Great to and have I'm you back. Here too. Uh, my name is Robin Essenbaum. I'm a special education teacher of uh, kindergarten through twelfth grade at Breckenridge and Breckenridge Missouri. And who's the guy behind you there? Uh, Sir William Marshall. <laughs> He's on loan from the history department. Okay, great. I hope it wasn't too creepy. I was looking for a photograph to uh, attach to last the, what, the show we did two weeks ago, and I found your school on Google, whatever you know, maps. And then I took a tour around your town. Wow, that's uh, that's rural. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, interesting place. Yeah. yeah. Um, is it Jody? Do you want yes. to introduce yourself? You you also teach there as well, right? I do. Yes, I teach seven through twelve facts at Breckenridge, and I also teach kindergarten through sixth grade keyboarding. What was the first thing you teach? I didn't hear the facts, family and consumer sciences. Oh, okay, interesting. We'll have to break that down a little bit. Sherry Edwards, do you want to say hello? Welcome. As soon as you can, Sherry. That's cool. Susan. Hi. <laughs> Quick introduction. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Susan Martin, and I'm here at Missouri Western State University in uh, St. Joseph, Missouri. I am the director of the Prairie Lands Writing Project, and I also was a rural educator at English Language Arts in Nebraska um, for 12 years. So I'm very excited to be here. Glad to be back. And Tom. And I'm Tom Pankowitz. I'm a retired uh, English teacher. I'm a consultant with the Prairie Lands Writing Project, and I'm working with uh, now six rural school districts on a uh, I3 grant that we have in, in argument writing. Great. 
And the two of you, or I think Susan, you said it, but uh, do you want to say a little more? You, you were particularly interested in the diversity question yourselves. Do you want to introduce maybe just briefly why you were so? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I um, I grew up in a fairly small town, but when I taught in an even smaller town, I actually found out that there was a great deal of diversity in uh, the rural community and among the rural communities around the school where I taught. And so I think actually rural schools have a lot to teach us about diversity, and so I'm interested in hearing what people think about that. I also had, you know, a lot of experiences trying to talk about diversity in a rural setting. Um, it has its own challenges. So uh, those are some things that I want to talk about. Terry. Um, so I, as we were doing this, I just want to say, Terry, I, I just, th there are some wonderful images of you with sheep and other things. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to, I thought of you and said, he's a rural educator. Why don't we get Terry on? <laughs> You are so many other things, too. I mean, we all are, but there you go. Ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, like you say, I, I, um, my other hat is um, Shepherd, but my main hat is I teach um, mostly general education courses. I'm an instructor at Western Kentucky University, and I'm the TC for Western Kentucky University Writing Project. Um, I taught high school for 10 years. I got into high school teaching through uh, subbing uh, because there are never enough subs in rural areas and uh, there's reasons for that there are lots of reasons for that that we could go in and talk about uh, but uh, I'm a city boy who took to the country pretty well and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm really interested in hearing what everybody has to say about uh, I teach a lots and lots of rural kids at the university so they have unique problems and unique abilities, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what you all have to say. Sherry. Last Hi. Uh, Sherry Edwards from rural Washington State, and I teach middle school language arts and uh, on a, the Colville Indian Reservation, so we're two hours from any major city and 45 minutes from oh where you can there's a Walmart <laughs> so um, but that's where I'm from and I'm excited to hear I looked over last week at the uh, argument part of your school's activity so I was interested in that also so let's see I'm anxious to hear hi Terry long time no see <laughs> hi Terry <laughs> So welcome everybody. Very exciting. And and look, diversity was one of the issues we wanted to talk about tonight. But as as I start thinking about um, you know un, um, migrant workers' children, uh, Sherry, your students, the students in Missouri, we're all. I mean, and the students in Kentucky, um, it's a pretty and. It's a pretty wildly diverse group of students we're talking about here, too, is it not? Um, already, is um, so. That's my that's <laughs> that's my kickoff here. So I want to join in on on that conversation wherever you'd like. <laughs> Don't be shy. <shocked. laughs> Well, the ironic thing about talking about talking diversity is the conversation itself isn't diverse. Generally, people talk about just the uh, demographics. Uh, in rural schools, there are diverse learners, and so in that sense, we are diverse. Now, if we look at the learner, we sadly don't have have a diverse curriculum. Uh, and I'll put that out there for conversation. Say a little more. What do you mean? All right. So if we wanted to, do, let's say, offer AP classes for some of our students who want more of an academic challenge, it's more difficult to do that in our school because of our small numbers. Um, now, because of that, what encourages us to want those courses are 
are diverse learners. We have the, the they expand from top to bottom and trying to meet the needs of those students calls for a diverse curriculum. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So if somebody else thinks it makes sense or you have a question, jump in please folks. So Paul floated around an article about technology mm -hmm. and the role of technology in rural schools and, and I would say you know some of some of it I agreed with and some of it I really didn't. But I think technology is an area that can really help diversify the curriculum. And I would say a really good thing about the rural schools where I am, and particularly New Mexico, is that there's um, been put in really good distance learning um, technology and particularly access to AP classes. And actually in New Mexico, um, every high school student has is mandated to take one online course. Um, and it's really to prepare them for sort of taking online courses later. But I think in some cases they actually have um, better access to things like that. Um, but I would say, in, in, at least in my community, the, the diversity and particularly the sort of um, racial and socioeconomic diversity in our schools is about zero. And that's sort of, and in our community as well. And so that was sort of part of what prompted me to bring up this question. I'd like to jump in. Um, the people that I work a lot with are migrant farm workers, and so you bring in a, um, a very diverse population, but you also bring in the issue of transiency and the fact that they move from state to state. Um, it, the education is, uh, for example, our migrants in Michigan often come from Texas and Florida, both of which have very, very different educational requirements. Um, and students can have a lot of difficulty graduating from high school. So that's really one of the challenges that we face here. Um, you know, that lack of place and how do those diverse students fit. And so that's, I think, a new dimension um, and with by, what we're by here, by here you mean Western Michigan? Yeah, Western Michigan. We're located, um, mm -hmm. but I, I also lived and taught in New Mexico, and it was a very different. There, there it was, you know, Hispanic, but there was a place. But here, because of the transiency, you have that um, lack of community identification, and that I think has a major impact on the education of our students. Um. To address uh, this notion of technology and almost everything that uh, in my county, it seems like um, all of these, even even curriculum, everything is is eventually leading to um, our students leaving. Um, our cultures are broken here, and our economies are broken. And I hate to be a downer here, but uh, we we've had uh, you know retirees come back to live here because Kentucky has no tax on retiree income, but our young people have uh, have have just moved on. We used to be the the largest dairy producing area in the state, and now uh, the average era, the average age of a dairy farmer here is in well into his sixties, and their kids are not taking over, and our schools have no clue as to how to help be and maybe they shouldn't be I don't know but I think I think they're they're not helping at least in our area they're not they're not part of the solution to this brain drain and uh, just loss of loss of our kids I don't know if other places are like this but that's what it feels like here yeah having taught in uh, rural southwest Wisconsin for a number of years as, as well as the upper peninsula of Michigan you know I think it it's a problem that um, is a lot larger than just um, you know at the school level because we see with technology all of the benefits um, that there are but also it makes the work so much easier and it requires less people to do the same amount of work and so these families um, when I was teaching in southwest Wisconsin the, the big family farm no longer existed and it was taken over by major corporations um, so students and their parents were seeking other communities to, to find homes and to find 
find work opportunities. Um, so yeah, what what have you seen, Terry, in terms of schools helping or trying to help? Well, you know, I'm no longer teaching high school, mm -hmm. um, but we had a lot of programs where it seems like we we were hollowing out. We were kind of hollowed out here, um, mm -hmm. where you would think that in an area that was highly agricultural, 50% of our students would go on to college or technical or, or uh, community college, um, and then large numbers would go into the military, and very few stay here. Uh, at all. Uh, you know, when they go to the university, it's not to learn something to bring back. It's right. to it's to get up and out. And uh, so there's a great, been a great hollowing out of things. And a lot of that is cultural. It's uh, due to the destruction of uh, tobacco as, a, as both an economic and a cultural force. Because um, people used to be able to actually buy farms uh, by farming the tobacco base. So, you know, we've we've lost a lot here, and we've had nothing. It's been like a vacuum, with nothing rushing in to fill it except, well, it's depressing. I don't want to go into it too much, but uh, you know, it's um, and we don't seem to have the leadership that that we need to recognize this. That we need we need lots more technical schools. We need them closer so the kids don't have to have to bus an hour to get there and back. Uh, I don't. I don't even know all the things that we need here because we need so many things. Missouri, speak up. You guys are pretty positive about your communities last time. <laughs> In a good way. Well, the opportunity to build community schools and various resources are there in rural communities because we have the land, um, and so that definitely would hope. I see that bringing back people. Uh, in our community. Now, I envision your rural community being a little bit bigger than our rural community. Um, there is one grocery store, there's the Dollar General, there's Casey's, there's another station. So we don't have a lot to offer as far as jobs. And if you think about the people who leave, especially the women when they go to college and don't come back, there aren't a lot of jobs in our community to cater to women unless they become a teacher right. um, because usually there is a school there. Um, so if there is a other resources that can further education then there's a reason to stay. I know that I am not from um, a real community. I'm from the city, Indianapolis. And the reason why I love living in a real community is because of the actual community that's built and as well the sense of home. And that's the reason I'm I'm inferring that people return because they love and miss the mm -hmm. sense of community. But it's not enough because you've got to take care of your family. And if there are no jobs, then you've got to make a choice. In a lot of our, our small towns that have uh, elementary schools, we have no middle schools in our county. We have K through 8 and then high school. and. Uh, the, the, the elementary schools are, you know, kind of the repository. <laughs> They're the, sometimes it's the beating heart of the community, and, yep. uh, and that's it. Yep. And what are we doing is we're putting them through the system that takes them away and out, and it just drives me crazy that we don't have people coming back. We don't have the, the fresh ideas and leadership you need in the schools to make them more viable. I mean, they could be. I really believe they could be a lot more viable. Um, well, I, I, it's such a big question, but w whenever tech came up, and, and in that article, you know, AP comes up. OK, we can give kids AP courses, but, you know, yeah, my my own my own sons went to a high school where they were trying to get away from the AP, you know, because it was constricting the curriculum. So, and, and you know, there's lots of reasons around that. But maybe there's a way to think about using tech in schools that isn't just about getting AP into into schools. <laughs> You know what I mean? That there are more creative, more thoughtful ways to use technology. <laughs> well, I'm wondering, uh, Paul. Yeah. 
Now, if we had more Google Hangouts like this, where rural students could talk to, for instance, urban students, I think that would be a great use of technology that would help rural students feel like they have something to contribute and to share. Um, I mean, I'm fairly new to Google Hangouts, and I think they're awesome. You know, let's do this in my classes. Uh, has anyone tried that? We could always do more. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Paul, don't you use Google Hangouts with your the youth voices connecting those students? Yeah. Um. And early on, you know, this is years ago now. We did have urban rural connections. Um, we don't have so many more. So it'd be great if we get got more out of these conversations. Um. Yeah. That that that's certainly interesting. Um. Paul. Yeah. Tom. When, when Terry was, was, was discussing Western Kentucky, it reminded me of, of, of what Linda was telling us, telling me about Breckenridge a few years ago, where it was a thriving community until the freight train stopped coming, which caused the grain store to close, which caused mm -hmm. everything else, and that what's left in the community is the school. And, and and if the school closes, will there be a community? You know, and it's it seems like like this that 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 this becomes a you know a problem. Terrence was talking about the people who live in the community who have roots in the community and why they want to live there and, and why they want to, to stay. But but without jobs, without that opportunity, you know. Driving to St. Joe from Bramer is an hour, over an hour. Driving to what is a half hour or so to go to Chillicothe, where there might be more opportunities for jobs. But within those small communities, there aren't any. And I'm not sure if technology in the school is that's going to improve the education, and that might bring more families to say we want our children to go to these schools because of those opportunities. But I'm not sure if, if unless those students become entrepreneurs in some way of, of, of creating or finding new jobs within that community, that, that, that the schools can take on that responsibility in addition to all of the other, all of the other issues that, they're, that they are taking on. I have a question. Um, what is the access for technology? I know we have it in the school, but within some of the rural communities, um, how much, I, I'd like to ask all of you, some of you live in more remote areas than others, what is the access to technology and over the last several years have you seen more of that? I know it's, I, I don't have that information, but I think that's a that's something we really need to be thinking about in terms of community-wide technology and internet access. And I know that can be problematic in rural areas. And it gets broken down, doesn't it, between like in schools, in in public spaces, yeah. and then in homes. Um, all yeah. that's different. Yeah, that's different. Terrence, did you want to say? Go ahead. No, I was just agreeing. Yeah, that is different. Um, I, at our school, we've been taking the state assessment. It's called the MAP. And we have bandwidth issues. Mm -hmm. uh, there was high stress levels of sustaining the test, or will it shut down? And a couple of tests um, shut down. And so, again, that high alert, what's going to happen? Uh, so throughout the year, not only for the testing period, bandwidth is a concern. There are certain times where we are... Um, encouraged not to get online because it competes with what the cafeteria needs to do um, and it'll slow the process down. So, yeah. I can, uh, Monday, I, Monday I was visiting a, a, a small school, rural school, and uh, Tom one, in a little bit. One, one grade level was taking the, the test and they were taking it in a computer room and I guess it was wired. I was visiting a, an English class, and their job was to do some research on, on their, wife, their little laptops in the classroom. 
none of them could get on the laptop because there was no access because the class was using the, the computer lab. So, you know, that's the kind of the, the, the situation. And I know there are other schools that, and this was a school that was, you know, kind of proud of its uh, technology. What, what about phones? Is that changing things? Is, is that giving people more access? No cell access here, so no cell for us that's a huge wow. that's a huge impediment to broadband because we could you know our our you know a few people have DSL but our broadband access is about zero and if we had cell access that would open it way up but it's not here and we hear not happening ever. <laughs> that should not happen. <laughs> That comment it should never happen later. We're pretty fortunate because the Colville tribes brought fiber into our school, and they've also wrote a grant for distance learning. But we're a little confused on that because it seems like it's just for adult learning. But we're putting it; it's for STEM classes, and a college in Montana is supposed to be providing curriculum for us, so we're putting that in our science classroom. Um, so we're really fortunate there because we were just on T1 lines. But even though we have that access, um, if the computer lab is full in testing, we still have in my classroom, language arts, trouble keeping connected. So there's still that issue. And we're a Google app school, so my students are always, we're always online working on the internet for research, research and writing. Sure. Blogging. Can you talk? Can you talk more about your students in terms of that um, people leaving? Um, um, does success equal leaving, or is it different? Well, it's a lot different here. <laughs> I think we have other issues that um, that affect our students and and what they decide to do. The I think the. I think only about half of the Colville, um, Colvilles live on the reservations. The rest of them are outside of. But for the people that live on the reservation, they like being there. And many of our students go off to college but never finish because that pull home is so strong. Mm -hmm. And so, but we have lost quite a few, you know, people having to move, move on so our school school population is dwindling and we're losing a lot of funding for that. But uh, it just depends on the on the student really and what what they want for their lives, whether they stay or leave. And many of them do get educated and then come back to help their tribe, their people. So I have lots of former students who have come back and they're uh, uh, counselors and they've become tribal councilmen and so police officers and you know lots of things to help their their tribe. The the narrative that you put out there the, about students who get pulled back to home and don't mm -hmm. finish college is that lack of success or do they eventually find success in other ways or how do that was, that's pretty complicated because. Mm -hmm. um, also, sometimes, well, there's a lot of, um, you know, drugs and alcohol on the reservation, so there's a lot of things that happen to the people, and when something happens to a family member, you don't stay at school, you come home to help. Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. Um, the other part is keeping up with things. Um, they get pulled into the story of the current moments, and may go off and do something and then not finish an assignment. So there's that issue. Um, at um, some of the colleges around here, they actually have um, offices for Native American students to help them get all their paperwork and financial aid and everything filled out because they get frustrated having to go to all those different offices. And so, I mean, there's just little things because when you're here on the reservation, everything is just here. And when you, then you go off to the 
college campus, everything is everywhere. <laughs> you know, you have to go from one place to another, and there's thousands of students, and they kind of get lost, and they call home, and they say, hmm, I know where people love me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's lots of issues. It's pretty complex. I just couldn't say one over the other, but those are some of the issues. Mm -hmm. so. And Jody, I had a thought to, if we could draw you in a little bit. Um, your your curriculum. It's um, can you describe what you teach a little bit? Because it because yeah. it sounds like it's about home. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, it's family and consumer sciences, and it's actually part of um, CTE, so career technical education. We're now career technical educators teaching family and consumer sciences. So um, I teach classes such as child development, nutrition and wellness, food, family living, um, and exploratory facts with the younger students so we go over every subject. Um, lots of personal development and obviously teach the basics of you know cooking and we do cover sewing. Sewing is no longer in the curriculum but I still go over sewing because I think it's important for students to know those life skills. So I do lots of life skills and also uh, really everything. It can all be related to careers and, you know, things they're going to use in everyday life. So I, I, I ask because I don't think anything like that exists in an urban school. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, you know, how the school makes that important or why. Well, actually, fax is being cut from a lot of school programs. There's lots of schools around us um, that have already cut their fax programs or are cutting their fax programs as teachers are retiring. So the big fax push right now is to make sure people know that it is career-based. Um, mm -hmm. So everything can be tied to careers and technical education. Mm -hmm. Sir, did you say you had not ever heard of that being in a school? Paul? I, it's unusual to be in a school, yeah, I think. <laughs> I've never heard of it not being in a school. It used to be called home economics, if that helps mm -hmm. any. <laughs> home ec. Do they not have it in New York? No. We just we just beat them with, with English and math, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, ex I'm, I'm, ex I'm ex exaggerating. Now, so. Well, it used but, to be called yeah. home economics, and it used to be strictly like cooking and sewing, but now it's much more than that. Mm-hmm. But see, and I, and I see it happening in the chat around here too. You guys should speak up a little bit. Uh, the, the reason I, I thought it was important to bring up is that uh, the, the diversity, curriculum diversity and diversity of, of individuals um, that Terrence brought up way at the beginning, um, that feels like an important part of all this. Uh, somewhere. Terrence, or, Terry and Terrence, you guys were asking each other questions. Jump in. <laughs> Where do you, yeah. I'm trying to not talk too much yeah, <laughs> to I give others head. a chance. So. Um, well, this issue is very near to me. I have been teaching in Bramer for, well, this will be coming up on my fourth year. As I said about two weeks ago, I was and you've uncertain. had the same kids for three of those years, right? Yes, Sorry, I have. And my and my eighth graders were the first group that I had as sixth graders. Um, and as I mentioned, I was unsure as to how I would fit in this community. Uh, if we go to just cultural diversity, as far as and you you have to extend beyond cultural diversity and look at racial diversity, but. A uh, further question is, does it really exist anywhere? When I taught in Kansas City, and I'll be teaching there this summer actually, I had one white kid, and I had 27 black kids. Here in Bramer, I have one class with a, a biracial girl, and that's from that's of about 75 students. 
So in the sense of racial, oh, and I have a, an Asian girl who was adopted. But in, in the sense of racial diversity, it's lacking. But I, I think that's everywhere. The thing that's necessary as far as um, diversity is giving the students experiences so that they can relate to various cultures. And this kind of connects with the students going away and not coming back. I think they find a connection outside of their racial, cultural um, experiences that they had in a smaller town. And so they attach themselves because people want to experience people. And so it's harder for them to come back because it, again, narrows their opportunities. And then the wish, aside from hoping that financial prosperity is something, the wish for their children is for them to have those same experiences. So that, even though the community is strong, the community is so small, and so that inadvertently affects the experiences that kids and parents have. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'd like to jump in. Um, I think what are our, I'd like to raise another question, and that is what are our community notions of diversity? We tend to think race or culture, but what about gender? What about socioeconomics? And are we, you know, our, our communities, are we still embedding that old notion of what just maybe a one-dimensional diversity? And my question is how can we, within our curriculum, within our schools, also using technology, how can we expand that understanding of diversity? And as you said, when they leave the community and find, you know, um, a comfortable place, um, whether that be, you know, gender, whatever, I mean, that's something that they never found. And maybe we need to, do we need to work on expanding our, our notions of what diversity is? And, and that was the um, caveat of the conversation. I said, generally, conversations mm -hmm. about diversity are not very diverse. Yes, I, yes. <laughs> and, and I think that's a notion. And I don't know how. It, it's so embedded. So how do we get about beyond that? Um, maybe you have an idea. I, I, I hope you do. Well, I think a, a place-based education program that um, critically examines um, you know, the community or communities that the school serves is certainly one way to open our students' eyes to the diversity that exists, the rich diversity that exists in rural uh, school districts and rural communities. Um, like you said, it, it's more than just uh, race, you know, it, it's gender, it's, it's sexuality, uh, it's socioeconomic, it's religion, um, all of these add to the rich diversity that exists uh, within our communities, and I think we really need our students to explore and examine these diversities. And I, I, I don't know if you've said it. I, I was trying to listen to it, but Karen, you, you certainly teach a lot about um, linguistic diversity as well, right? Um, the Are you talking to me? Yes. There's two Karens. Yeah, um, yeah. I, and I think, um, you know, one thing I always tell my students is, if you take away language, you're taking away a major part of identity. And in my own work with migrant farm workers, uh, you know, you have to, you may not speak the Spanish, but within our communities, you have to at least understand and respect that part of, of culture and make some, you know, effort to uh, communicate and understand. And sometimes we're very, I think, embedded within our own linguistic um, our, we guard our linguistic, um, our own language very carefully. So, and sometimes there's this fear of reaching out to someone who is linguistically different. Where, you know, it's amazing how far a smile can go to communicate. And I've learned this over and over in my visits to migrant migrant camps. Um, so, yeah, we have to learn at least um, maybe a few words. And there's just we have to. Un that and I would really um, hearing you popped up with a question for Sherry yeah, about yeah, the tribal right, Sherry. and I, I'd love to hear about the tribal languages. Well, the tribal languages in our area they're almost dead, so they're trying to bring them back. The uh, couple of the tribes have started immersion schools, but those are let's see, that's. 
a while away and there's one in Spokane, Washington. So, um, but we, part of the distance learning idea was to um, bring, we have one of the units going in the culture classroom so that we can teach the language at our school. And we've done that before. We've had elders come in and, and help with learn the language, but most of my students have not been raised with the language. Most of their, very few of their elders speak the language, and very few of even my students' grandparents speak the language, but they, those parents or grandparents did grow up with people who spoke the language, and they, when I taught them, their um, English was um, different because they would speak in phrases like they would speak if they were speaking their grandparents' native language. And so there was this sort of rhythmic, poetic nest to some of their language. Mm. But that's not really there anymore. So. When, when we think about language, um, I mentioned that I speak French to my children, and when I began speaking French, there was lots of pushback because people were wondering who would speak English to them. And I responded, their entire world. If I am the only person who speaks French, they're going to get English from everyone else. Where's your and French come from, I, parents? <laughs> well, where's, oh, where's your when French I was from? In the when I was in the seventh grade, mm -hmm. there was a beautiful French teacher named Madame Selkie. She is my inspiration. <laughs> so I'm, I, I learned it in middle school and I kept it actually because of her. <laughs> but I want to pass it to my, stu my, my own children and I want them to teach it to their children. And so what I have to do with anything is teach them to set goals. I say, hey, you're going to speak French to your, your children and you're, they're going to speak French to their children. And when we all get together, we're all going to speak French. Mm -hmm. I think the reason why many people stop is because of um, assimilation. And they want to assimilate to uh, culture. And by default, they want to forget the, the very roots that they have uh, and their family and generations are grounded in. It's not cool to speak another language when everybody else is speaking um, English. So it's important to teach them uh, to set goals so that that way, whenever they're challenged, and this kind of hits on self-esteem, whenever they're challenged, then they have um, a comeback that is not something that's coming from, ex uh, from an external, but from internal. I want to speak another language because this is a part of me, not I want to stop because I want to be a part of who you want me to be. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It does. Um, I, you know, I mean, I there there are. I teach in a, in a. I'm building, helping to build a new school in the South Bronx that is replacing the school that is that failed because eighty percent of the students um, talk about transients um, disappeared in this school within a year. Um, and the students who replaced them were all speaking Spanish, right? Um, and, and of course, just because we're a new school doesn't mean we're going to change that pattern. So we're, we're kind of facing those kinds of issues all the time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so language is a source of failure and pain and division as much as it is the richness that you just described, too. It just feels to me. Uh, Paul, um, you know, you talk. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that, of course, my students have a very different experience, not assimilation. They were forced to go on reservation. In fact, I have families whose um, grandparents were blocked from leaving our area. They're from the Umatilla in Oregon and the road was closed and they couldn't go home. They had to make their home there because that was the day that the reservation was formed. And so that's they, they live here because that's when the, where the line was drawn and they were not allowed to go home. 
and then they started being sent to the boarding schools and um, they could not speak their native language they could not speak you know they couldn't use learn their traditions it's a very sad story so and, and Josh is in an earlier le you know, two weeks ago we talked a lot about or a little bit about place-based education do your students know that history yes I've just put a link in the um, uh, chat on the on the other site and oh, I can put it here I guess it's in there okay. and then okay. this is this is the um, what uh, three of my students researched the history of the boarding school and then also mm. included information about their what they do in their world because they're living in two worlds so yes we do we do research that and there are still very very painful experiences and memories from the people that I work with in my school because they grew up in boarding schools so just think of the fact that they did not have parents then watching them and then they didn't learn to be parents mm. so that completely disrupted um, their culture and their way of life so the, it's very amazing that some of the families have held on to those traditions as an extension um, many of our students while they aren't tribal they have had they, they have a school culture and they have a home culture hmm. uh, and many of them they've struggled they live double lives hmm. we see them from the eight to three and we think everything is great um, but when they get home there's a true struggle uh, of where is food going to come from hmm. of I'm going to have to babysit my sister or when is my mom coming home around our community meth is meth is is a home wrecker and many students are watching their parents use meth so in a sense they don't have uh, a model as to what it looks like to be a parent so yeah I can definitely understand that disparity yeah, to follow up on that I think uh, you know we, we're talking basically in your language broadband curriculum this brain drain we're talking about um, issues of power and who has the power and who does not have the power and if you don't have the power and you don't feel like you can get the power what happens is despair and hopelessness and I think I would like to see schools you know become I mean we had these we had these things in the south they were called citizenship schools and basically there were ways to teach people how to get the vote you know uh, African Americans trying to get the vote throughout the South, and uh, they went to citizenship schools to learn how to uh, exercise power in their communities, and they were very successful. Why couldn't schools become citizenship schools where they learn to exercise power in their communities and solve problems? It seems to me like Sherry students are doing something like that beginning to do something like that by searching out their history and making people aware of conditions as they are and then moving forward from there. And Terry, I think to your point too that um, our schools can, can serve the community at large, it, not just the students but the parents. Um, Sherry mentioned using uh, distance learning for adults, you know, having the adults in our communities come into our schools and utilize the resources that we have to empower them, which then, you know, helps change that dynamic at home, those double lives uh, that they might be living uh, mm -hmm. for our students. But, oh, wonder from Brackenridge, what's resonating for you? With some of this conversation. Well, I think we're a lot like Terrence was saying. Our community is very much like his, only a little smaller. No jobs, no homes, nothing, nothing here. Um, drug use by parents is worse than with the kids, and so yeah, you don't know where your kids are coming from. I mean, I think we have a pretty good idea of what's happening, but it, it's it's big problem with. Getting them to school, mm -hmm. yeah. just coming to school, 
can be a problem. And, and a lot of it is the small kids, because they're K-12. We have a lot of kindergarten and first and second grade kids who miss or are late every day because their parents can't get up. And they can't get them here. So that kind of shows where education lies in the hearts of some of these folks. It's not the priority. And um, I don't know how to change that. Um, we do the best we can. Mm -hmm. You know, this sounds, it sounds oh, like, it sounds like a, a catch-22, that you work very hard to educate students so they'll be successful. But for them to be successful, they have to leave the community. And so it's as if the more successful you are, the more you seem to be, be encouraging students to, to find their lives somewhere else. How do we how do we educate our students and at the same time encourage them to stay within the small communities and help these communities regenerate? Well, I think Terry said something in the chat a while ago about uh, why can't school address the problems in their community as the curriculum. So why in our local schools, why don't we have more control over uh, working with our community and with what entities are there? And maybe starting our own ideas or what can the kids do? I mean it seems like you know we've been we've we've taken away the local power and Somebody else is telling us what we need in our schools and our community, and we probably need to start reclaiming, you know, what we need to do for our students. Because my my kids can stay; they don't really need to leave, to leave the reservation. They can hunt, they can fish, they have a place to live, and you know that does that sound like a great life? I Even mean, if if that's how you want you want to do, and you spend your time helping your elders, I mean that's a a gift in it themselves. So why can't we help them become better at what they have right there on the reservation and develop some kind of business with the with for their tribe right there. But that would take us away from, you know, as a priority school what the state and federal government government tells us we have to do. I don't know what you all think of that. But <laughs> and they're doing that through the standards, Common Core, and the and the testing, and and, and so forth, mainly. Or, I would I would think ways? it's yeah. mostly the testing pressure. Mm -hmm. I think that's the big thing because the Common Core, you can, you know, that's designed for you know good creative thinking. Although not everybody's going to be there at the same age, testing it like that isn't helpful, but. I think it's the testing pressure that really is forcing schools not to teach students, but to teach programs and requirements. And I think that's that's part of our issues. I would, which gets back to what Terrence said: is that if you have diverse students, they are, they will ask for what they want. And Karen said. Um, the rich get richer and they'll get what they want in those schools that have the funding to do that. Susan, were you about to say something? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I know everyone is saying this, but this is the worst year I've seen in terms of, you know, good projects, problem-based learning, place-based education units being scrapped because of test preparation. I mean, all the good we could be doing, I mean, and it's, it's happened in cycles in the, the 20 years I've been in education, but I've never seen it this bad. I just right and left, teachers are giving up good units, good community based field trips and projects and guest speakers, and all, the, all the good stuff that made learning rich and tied to community. It, it's very frustrating. And I don't know. Maybe there's a revolt coming. I hope there is. Well, yeah, in New York State, there's a big. It hasn't hit the city yet, but there's a there's a, a growing opt out movement happening, and, and so yeah, there is. I think, yeah, 
parents are starting to object. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't listen to teachers, but they do listen to parents, right? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. so, yeah, I, there's some hope there. I think. I, I I wanted to go around and ask, uh, try to end on a kind of a positive note, and and ask what you think um, we can learn from rural schools, just briefly. What what's what's sort of one thing that you think we can grab onto from rural schools? And Terrence, would you start us off? Just go around. Uh, could you come back to me? I'd like to yes. process that. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody jump in then, and then we'll start. I think we don't let very many people fall through the cracks. We have the ability to notice mm -hmm. who needs help and who needs something. I think that's that's key. Linda. Yeah, I have to agree with her because when you only have 25 students, um, they don't fool you very often. You know this, who's not there, and you notice what's going on and what's wrong, and you know they're not acting right and they need help, they need this. So I think you can act on it faster. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have the problems that, that bigger schools do. You send a kid in the office once in a great while. Otherwise, that's it. Don't you think so? Robin, any further thoughts? Robin, no? Okay. I don't think so. Okay. Kathy, or Kathy, this is Karen, sorry. Um, me, Karen. Um, I think we have a gift of place, a more defined place than in rural areas. And that has so much potential. Can I? So, so what happens so though with um, with migrant farmers? Do they come and form communities then around their house? Well, um, you know, a lot of them their their biggest community might be in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas or wherever they live in in Florida. Um, many times, um, families come together, um, you know, to work. Um, in the north, there are three main migrant trails in the U.S., um, the Midwest, East Coast, and West Coast. But um, in many small communities, uh, the migrant farm workers are, do become a part of the community. We have a, several uh, um, municipalities around here that they're, they're, they're embraced. And then there are others where, you know, there is um, definite racism. But um, I think within the migrant community itself, there's an amazing sense of community, and um, I think it's part of culture, it's part of place, it's part of language, and in my um, very humble opinion, we have a lot to learn from that, and I've said that many, Josh has heard me say that many times, so, um, you know, what is that community, and um, I, I think we have a lot to learn, but they you know, just by becoming in our communities just for the short time that they are during the summer. Um, here in Michigan, they work during the summer and usually return south in the winter. Um, they bring a lot. And what we're seeing is a lot of the families are settling out. And they're becoming permanent residents of Michigan. So hopefully they're bringing that community to us and we have a lot to learn from them. We we'll have to have more of this. <laughs> Sorry, everybody's had. It's been a lot. Um, Josh, sure. I think um, perseverance and resiliency. Honestly, um, you know, education reformists have been trying to consolidate and take apart rural schools for over a hundred years now, and we're still here. We still have powerful voices in the field. And, um, you know, I think that's one positive thing that rural schools and rural communities can showcase is their resiliency and their willingness to preserve and promote uh, their communities. Right. Right. Karen? Pass and power. Um, I would say just a, a really strong sense of community and, again, that tie to place and you know, in, in my community, I would say a very close tie to the land and sort of what that, in, you know, what that means with us being here. 
Yeah, that's a theme we haven't talked about much, but that that's really important. Yeah, the sense of yeah, connection to to nature, right? I mean, is that right. what you mean? Yeah. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. When you when you don't have sewer systems or somebody to pick up the trash or recycling, you think a lot more about it. I mean, that's just at a really basic level. But. Mm -hmm. Jody. Um, I think especially in my facts classrooms, I have a lot more time hands-on with the students. So we have a lot more time to do labs because I have smaller classes. So we do have two kitchens in my room, but I might only have two or three students to do a kitchen. We're in a bigger classroom. I might not have enough kitchen space for all the kids to be able to do things every day. So having that small class size really lets me have a lot more hands-on time with my students, which I think is crucial, especially in my department. Sounds like you have a maker space. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Terrence. Um, I'm going to piggyback off of pretty much what everyone said. When we think about a bigger school and the threat of consolidation, mm -hmm. education works in smaller class size with a, a, a great teacher-student ratio. If we make a bigger school, then the ratio is distorted. In a smaller community, the people are close-knit and there's buy-in. In the classroom, the students are close-knit and there's buy-in. I think that the world can learn from a smaller community, a rural community, that there is power in fewer numbers. There's strength in fewer numbers. We don't need to consolidate. Why? Because then that spreads out the number of people who are actually paying attention to the students. If you look in an urban uh, community, there's not a lot of buy-in because people haven't had a chance to form those relationships. My students have 25 kids in their class. They know those 25 kids like the back of their hand. And so I think they other communities can learn smaller is better actually in the classroom and That's the community and the school Susan Tom and Terry <laughs> okay uh, I want to echo what Karen said about access uh, immediate access to the natural landscape I think that's huge and I also think you know my experience is uh, a rural education environment invites opportunities to step up you know because no one else is speaking for uh, this viewpoint I think sometimes people who might be more quiet will feel like a need they'll see an opportunity and they'll take it you know I mean I never was such an outspoken feminist until I was in a rural community where no one was was that person and so I became that person and I saw students doing that too uh, speaking up you know and, and filling in the gap uh, representing voices. I think that rural education allows people to take this opportunity. Cool. Huh? Mine is a gross or a gross uh, statement. So be ready for it. But it's, teachers in rural schools have more freedom to plan and to put together independent class plans. They can toss out a curriculum. Curriculum. They can toss out the curriculum to engage students in learning, and they're not tied as much as urban schools are to you know, like data analysis and other nice programs. They're, they're, they might have more freedom to, and I know that's an exaggeration. But that's. An impression I have. Terry. I think one of the, the values of, uh, of rural communities is that they come together in times of crisis um, and there's a real generosity of spirit and resources and time when we have these crises and what we're lacking is understanding that we are in crisis and the crisis is a life or death situation for rural communities and without the leadership in the community and the schools and amongst the students themselves we're not going to make it we're just not we're going to continue to be under the thumb of people who do not understand us and do not care 
Wow. Okay. Thanks, my brother. <laughs> Thanks. That was the right thing to say. <laughs> yes. So something you said earlier, and I want to say, you know, um, I hope technology is a place, is certainly a way I can connect with you all, um, uh, to think about those classes where, I think you did say it earlier, Terry, um, where we talk about how to exercise the power of your in, um, in your community, um, exercise power in your community. Um, and, you know, there are networks out there, but... Uh, those networks seeing each other do that, I think, is really important too. So that's just some of the, some of the thoughts I have. Thank you all for contributing um, to the conversation here tonight. Um, I'm I'm okay that uh, you know we this isn't leading to an obvious next solution. Uh, thank you for the the depth of conversation here tonight, though, and um, I think we'll have some ideas as we go. Um, we are here every Wednesday uh, evening at. Um, edtechtalk.com slash ttt. Um, Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo um, set that up several years ago, and we thank them for that. Um, it's a channel of the World Bridges Network at edtechtalk.com. Thank you all, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you Wonderful. Bye. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>